All right, welcome back to KYD. We're glad you're here. How about last week? Last week was probably one of the most exceptional experiences we've had since being in Alaska. Totally. And if you haven't seen that episode, we titled it, This is Alaska. And we'll just wait here for a minute. Yeah, you can go watch it. And then, <laughs> well, this video's not going anywhere. No. Right? No. So definitely go check that out. But we, after that video, we ended up traveling from the Kenai through Cooper Landing, in through Whittier, and then arrived into Anchorage, where we spent the night at a Harvest Host at the Alaska Botanical, Botanical Garden. Botanical Gardens. But here's the thing. We've been covering so much ground in this Alaska mm -hmm. season mm -hmm. that we haven't hit the pause button to answer your questions. And we keep getting the questions. How are the roads to Alaska? How bad are the mosquitoes? <laughs> My personal favorite. <laughs> what was the cell coverage like? How are the RV parks, particularly without making reservations? Mm -hmm. And were the Big upgrades, one. were the upgrades that you did really necessary? So here's the plan for this episode. <laughs> Trish. Not only are we going to show you Cooper Landing, mm -hmm. but we're also going to talk about Whittier, our mm -hmm. little time in Whittier, yep. and then where we stayed at the Botanical Garden. Yes. How pretty was that? And then, oh, it was gorgeous. Yeah. And then we're going to interweave these top five questions into the episode. But first, coffee. Thank you. She's a beaut. You know, I will say, one of the things that we don't do here enough at KYD is subliminal messaging. So not all Harvest Host locations are vineyards and wineries and such. Some are museums and gardens. tell you where we are for this episode and where we're recording this. You're just gonna have to figure it out on your own. And we're not gonna leave any clues either. Okay? You're funny, Mark. Ooh. Look what we found. The information center. Question number one about the roads. How were the roads? So, quick disclaimer. We're only talking about the Alaskan Highway, mm -hmm. formerly known as the Alcan. Mile zero starts at Dawson Creek, goes up through Watson Lake. Meandering, gorgeous. White horse, crosses the border, ends at Fairbanks. Yes. That's the section we're talking about. And that road was spectacular. We didn't have any problems. Now, you should know that there's one section between Destruction Bay and through Beaver Creek to the border and even beyond the border up to, I guess where the road ends, it ends in Delta Junction. Mm -hmm. That section right there is full of frost heaves. What a frost heave is, is when the ice comes underneath the pavement and it freezes, it pushes up the asphalt and it mm -hmm. makes this big bump and then that keeps happening. Mm -hmm. Over and over, and so it's like these inverse speed bumps. And it feels like a roller coaster sometimes. <laughs> so what should you know about coming up the Alaskan Highway? I think one of the big things is the flag system. Mm -hmm. And that alarms you. <laughs> that gives you literally the orange flag that you either have a frost, frost heave, heave coming up, or yeah. there's a big pothole, or there's a break between the road and the bridge. And it just is a warning so that you can pay attention. So we went up in late June, and by then they have already made some repairs to the road. So if you were to go up in April or May, there might not be flags yet, so keep right. that in mind. There might not be flags, and when you go up kind of a little bit earlier, they might be making a lot more repairs. And construction. So you'll be slowed down, and you'll have usually an escort car that will bring you through mm -hmm. the construction site. And so keep that in mind, is you'll have to be patient and flexible. You can come up against somewhere with a flag, and you could wait there for 15, 20 minutes before the pilot car gets you and brings you back. Now, in our mm -hmm. case, we had tops 15 miles of gravel roads on the entire highway. Right. But that was before we put on our mud flaps. Yeah, that's right. The, the rock tamers. The rock tamers. And so those rocks from the construction really mm -hmm. did, yeah, they did chip away at the front end of our rig. So that might be another thing for you to consider. So we don't want to tell you, oh, don't worry about the road. It's not a problem. And then, you know, come up here a little carefree. You should be concerned. And the reason is those frost heaves, if you were going too fast, let's say you're going over 60 miles per hour, mm -hmm. and let's say your trailer was pushing the weight limits on its capacity. Mm -hmm. 
and you were to hit a bump because you looked up at the last minute and you didn't see a flag or it wasn't marked and you hit a frost heave, all that weight on your axles, you could blow out a leaf spring, mm -hmm. you could blow a tire, you could hurt it, you could damage an axle. Mm -hmm. And we, when we've seen this and we've heard this, so it is, it is real. You need to be prepared, but when you are prepared, most likely it's gonna go nice and smooth yeah, if you. Yeah, if you have the right equipment and, you're and your guard is up high. And your guard is high and you're paying attention and you're gonna go slow, you're gonna be fine. Yeah. A couple other points. We heard that the Toke Cutoff and the Cassier Highway are not near as good as the Alaskan Highway. So we intentionally are gonna take that route home so that we can show you exactly what those roads look like and kind of we complete want, our road assessment. Yes, yeah, so we wanna give you all the juicy tidbits. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> One of the things that you'll find when you get up here is it's almost like a resume. People are like, well, did you do this? Well, yeah, did you do true. that? <laughs> so um, people wanna like, you know, roast you. They want their you. stamp, they want their they stamp. They wanna see like what you were willing to take. So for <laughs> us, we haven't really done like the crazy hard roads because we wanted to get here, we wanted to get to certain destinations and we wanted our rig in one piece. <laughs> We're gonna go find a cool location to talk about cell phone coverage, but while we do that, you check out Cooper Landing. Come on through there. Take this side. One, two, three. I have a very special tool. What's that? The umbrella. An umbrella. We look like such tourists with the umbrella, but the deal is I can't record footage with the cannon if it starts raining. And it looks like it's sunny, but there's actually rain coming down. It's not sunny. It's oh, I forgot my rain jacket. Right here is exactly the intersection of the Russian and the Kenai, which is exactly where we wanted to go. So the question is, is Caleb gonna be able to hook up here without waders, without getting deep in there now. Well, I'm glad he started squawking. Now, some people believe that Alaska is just way off the grid and using like archaic satellite dishes for their cell phone coverage. It wasn't until recently that the Verizon was actually up here mm -hmm. and that's all we have. Other people have said, hey, we're gonna do multiple carriers and split the phones up between our families and that's awesome. Too complicated for us. We just said Verizon's what we have, Verizon's well, what we're using. And plus we've traveled all of North America and have had exceptional coverage yeah. with Verizon in Mexico, Canada, yeah. and the States, and now Alaska. So. Mm -hmm. The bottom line is, if you work, like we do, and you need to have connectivity, like we Very do. Very important. And you need to stay in touch with loved ones, like we do, then you're gonna be fine anywhere along the highways and in most major cities and even small towns. Well, to be safe, I would say all the small cities and the towns. Yes. On the road, that's dicey. Oh, that's true. Okay, so there were some sections on the way up where we lost it for maybe a, uh, one or two hours, but the mm -hmm. same is true for Texas, mm -hmm. and the same is yeah, true, true for along the coast of Oregon. Now, we've noticed in some towns, it'll oscillate between 3G and LTE, but even mm -hmm. 3G is enough to upload a video. I can start it you know, in the evening, and by the morning, it's up. Mm -hmm. Certainly check email and keep in touch, but in terms of just talking on the phone, do people do that still? <laughs> That's fine. And and you know, you don't need data to do that. You just need a cell phone signal. And yes. that we found almost almost everywhere. Yes. With the exception of the remote areas. Yeah. In worst case scenario, you can just grab some Ethernet cable and just plug into one of those bad boys. You'll be <laughs> fine. fit in there? Holy. I feel like I'm getting my car washed. Smokes. All right, Caleb, what do you think? We, we go in tunnels to get to Whittier. We go, on, we go in tunnels to get to the other side of Whittier. It's nothing oh. but tunnels. If you want to stay away from mosquitoes, then all you have to do is just stay away from super dense, wooded, still water forests. Which is pretty easy to do in Alaska, really, right? Totally. <laughs>
<laughs> All right, so we've heard a lot of stories about mosquitoes, a lot of stories. And this is kind of a tricky topic for us because you know from, I think two episodes ago that we had this crazy infestation <laughs> of mosquitoes. The worst. It was nuts. And a lot of people ask, where did the mosquitoes get in from? And they got in through the slide. Mm -hmm. I, you know, these slides are not 100% airtight sealed. and sealed. But it's important to mention that other than that single night, mm -hmm. we've had not hardly any other experience with mosquitoes. Not even a little, not even like, give me some spray or nothing. No, we haven't worn anything. We haven't used any repellent, none of it. When we did have our problem, we were close to Denali. We were in Talkeetna. We were close to um, tundra. We were, yeah, we were backing forest, a lake. Still water. Even in that situation, I talked to the locals and they said there were no mosquitoes in Talkeetna for three years. Yeah. And then this year something just hatched. So. If you ask me, I think it's a little earlier in the season. I don't know this, but mm -hmm. I think April, May, June. Might be a little more mosquito heavy. On the Kenai Peninsula, which includes like Kenai, Homer, Seward, the coastal area of Alaska, I think you're closer to the water, the ocean. You're getting the ocean breeze. Mm -hmm. You're getting a different barometric pressure. Yeah. And um, I don't think it's as much of an the issue. The elements are just different. Yeah. So, um, but it really depends on the season. It mm -hmm. depends on how late you're here so that the mosquitoes have time to die off. Yeah. And, um, you know, whether they're having a problem or not. Like I said, this was a little bit tricky of a topic because we don't want to tell you that mosquitoes aren't that bad and you come up here and you'll be like, Mark and Trisha, liars, this is terrible. <laughs> it could very well be where you are. I think yeah. what we're really trying to say is it just depends on the area, the time of year, and where you happen to be and how it happens to be in that particular area. Right. And also, being near still water, heavily mm -hmm. wooded areas, but we're there, not good. But we're, I mean, you know, as a joke, we decided to come here and we're in exactly the environment you wouldn't want to be. And Except there's- Except we're not here in like May. That's true. This would be probably flooded with mosquitoes. Yeah, maybe, but yeah. right now, nothing. We were told this is a great place for lunch. So let's pick up some sandwiches and show you around our RV park because we're gonna talk about reservations next. Ooh. I like it. Get a, you know, I like this. <laughs> like a trucker. I like it like a trucker. Okay, so let's talk about the RV parks. To be completely candid, I have had to readjust my expectations of RV parks when traveling in Alaska. Mm -hmm. What you get for $50 in the lower 48 is a wide space, maybe even a fire pit, a table. Maybe even grass. Maybe some like grass. And you just don't get that up here. And mm -hmm. you know what? I don't, I don't, I, I can hardly complain about it. And here's why. Their season is so short. Mm -hmm. I'm sure if I owned an RV park, I'd be like, yeah, I'll get to that next season, right? <laughs> they tend to be dirt lots. The RV parks are very tight together. And because there's a supply and demand, they're fairly expensive. Right. So all we're suggesting is that for the same price that you'd pay in the lower 48, you're not going to get the same benefits. Yes. But you're going to get Alaska. You're and gonna... this is a prime example of what you're going to get. And as an option, you're gonna have a lot of opportunity to dry camp and to use BLM land mm -hmm. or Crown land as you're coming up through Canada or dry camping options or you're just sleeping on the side of the road in a like pull, gravel pull off or like a snow plot lot. Yes. If you don't wanna spend a bunch of money on RV parks in Alaska, you don't have to, which is mm -hmm. good because then you can save some of that money to put it toward excursions. Now the big question is, how has it gone without having reservations, particularly in the peak season of Alaska and mm -hmm. with the salmon run? Because we were scared to death. We, people were saying, oh, you better make those reservations in advance because when the salmon are running, there's no way you're gonna be able to get a park. Right. I don't know why people like to scare people. I, it's I, just not true. It's just not the case. So mm -hmm. we have not made a single reservation. In fact, the only time we did make a reservation um, it was to stay somewhere seven days because it was through the Kenai Peninsula and we thought there's no way and even then, there was plenty of availability. We didn't need to do that. Now, with that said, if the dip net fishing is happening and it's hot and all the locals have flooded to the nearby RV parks, you might not be able to get a strand of days together in the same spot, mm -hmm. but you're not gonna be out with nowhere no. to stay. Yeah. It's just not gonna happen. I will say that the Kenai Peninsula is where all the locals from Anchorage tend to spend their weekends. So, mm -hmm. just like the lower 48, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday are gonna be busier than Monday through Thursday. So mm -hmm. just know that and move your travel according to the weekend schedule because it's gonna be busier on the weekend. So bottom line, be prepared to spend a little bit more with fewer services, but know that you can offset those costs with dry camping and even what we're doing right now, we're spending $20 a night 
with an ocean front and a dry camping lot. So mm -hmm. it'll all kind of wash out if you just stick within your budget. And we get that question a lot. How much does it really cost? Mm -hmm. It costs whatever you want to make it. If you want to dry camp and spend nothing, or if you want to spend 50 to $80 a night, mm -hmm. you can do either. And you really can't compare one family to another because if it's if it were just Mark and I driving, mm -hmm. right, we would have a totally different setup. We have totally. two teenagers. We're making like five meals a day. We're doing dishes all the time. We're burning through a lot of water. We're burning through a lot of water, a lot of energy. Do you want the solitude and the peace of quiet all by yourself out in the middle of nowhere for a few days? Or are you looking for more of the city and the shopping scene and that type of stuff? Mm -hmm. All right, so now we're going to enjoy this lunch and then we're going to talk about the last question, which is were the upgrades necessary? So I want to just go through all the different upgrades and give you kind of a, a little update on how they're doing. When I did the upgrade videos, what I should have really mentioned is that some of these upgrades were not just for Alaska. We've been on the road full time for over two years. In that time, we've got to experience some of the things that we thought would be helpful, a little bit more convenient, easier, safer. And so we kind of created a list of things that we really liked. And so this was an, Alaska was an opportunity for us to make those upgrades before we came up here. Cause a lot of the comments were like, Mark, you're going overboard. These things aren't completely necessary. And that's probably true, but they did make things a lot smoother. Okay. First up is the Firestone Ride Right. Is it essential? No, not for Alaska, because there's plenty of people up here without air. Do I love it? Absolutely. When we're going over those frost heaves and everything starts bouncing, it just stabilizes faster, it makes a smoother ride, and it keeps the truck level. And I just like looking out on the truck and seeing everything level. I know it's a little OCD, but I love it. Okay, let's talk about the Rock Tamers and the Vi-Air. The, my Vi-Air quick disconnect is right behind here. So let's talk about the Vi-Air first. Is it essential for Alaska? I would say it's essential for RVing. If you have RV tires or truck tires that are above 65 PSI, you're gonna need a pump to do it yourself or you're gonna have to go to like a truck stop or a tire store in order to get the proper air. So that's essential. Now, do you need an onboard air system with the quick disconnect? No, that's only just super cool and I absolutely love it. What is essential is just having the pump and we've put that in our Amazon page that you can check out and there's all sorts of different options with those pumps. Now the Rock Tamers, uh, I would say is essential. I'm sorry that I waited to get these until we got to Fairbanks. Uh, I thought that those mud flaps, which were those mud flaps on the truck were gonna be sufficient, but they weren't. One thing that I did hear from rock tamers after I put these on is you have to have at least three inch, three inch clearance from the ground. And the reason is it, once you put the load down, if the flaps are touching the ground, they could actually be kicking debris up onto the rig. So that's something to watch out for. But since I put these on, we haven't had any more rock chips, but the real test will be our drive home through the construction zones. All right, the big question was the fuel tank. Is 60 gallon fuel tank, was that was that really necessary for Alaska? And the answer is no, there's fuel everywhere. We pass more fuel stations than I could even possibly stop at with a 30 or a 60 gallon tank. Now, with that being said, was the transfer flow 60 gallon midship fuel tank one of my favorite upgrades? Oh my gosh like by far. It is so ridiculously awesome. To <laughs> my favorite, my favorite. When's the last time we had fuel? It's crazy. I mean, I just keep driving. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens when Trish drives. She just keeps driving. I'm like, hey, let's pull over there and we'll like, we'll load the drone. She's like, what, what, what? And Trish is right. She just keeps driving. I mean, like it, it's fantastic to be able to go like seven, 10, 12 days without getting fuel. I think we, were, we, we go into a city and we leave the city without having to think about fuel stations. We drive on the road. It's been nice. All right, let's talk about the Hensley Hitch and I almost forgot about this. And the reason is this is not an upgrade I did for Alaska. This is an upgrade that I did specifically to eliminate sway. But I knew if I forgot to include a review or an update on this hitch, everyone would have completely freaked out and be like, I cannot believe you did not mention the Hensley Hitch. We've been asking for weeks. The fact is it does eliminate sway 100%. This trailer for some reason just had a lot of sway and this solved the problem, there's no question. It did, however, take me way longer than I thought it would to figure out how to get everything hooked up. Uh, I ended up using some uh, spray lubricant on the Stinger and that helped out a ton. So I have some tips and some tricks to make it an easier process for you. But in terms of, uh, I am good at uh, hooking up now, I can do it very proficiently and easily, uh, no more issues there and I, I mean, the peace of mind with this hitch is fantastic. So if you have sway 
or are concerned about sway, there's no question that this hitch is fantastic. All right, let me take this off so that you can see the Moride SRE 4000. This was an upgrade that we did prior to coming to Alaska, probably something we did specifically because of Alaska. We've heard that the roads were bad and some of the frost heaves, and you know what? When it comes to a travel trailer or fifth wheel, what have you got? A couple axles? leaf springs, leaf spring hangers, a tongue jack, and, this, and that's everything. So to upgrade the suspension to smooth out how things go, you could be on a road, not see a frost heave, maybe it's not marked, maybe at that same day you've got more water than you normally have and you're a little heavy, and we've heard stories where leaf springs break, axles break, and it's bad news. So for the price of this upgrade, I think it's it's worth having because it's gonna really smooth out the, the ride of the trailer. I'm glad we had it. There were situations we were driving up where we did hit a frost heave and we were following Bob, if you remember, and we were going pretty fast. And I think between the air and the increased suspension and the proper PSI on our tires, we just kind of floated over the frost heaves. And I thought, man, it was really good in that moment to have what we needed to not get out of control and have everything just stabilized. So the other thing I think is essential is to weld in covers on these leaf spring hangers. Uh, you know, I did that on Ginger 1.0 and we did that for this reflection. Since I've done that, I've seen on Facebook a lot of people with their leaf spring hanger completely flipped up. So it's a, you know, if you have access to like a, a welding shop, it's pretty easy to just put on an extra, just reinforce those leaf spring hangers and you'll be in good shape. Someone's gotta hold the camera. <laughs> Were they pretty dirty? Yeah, I, I think so actually. Well, and there's like saltwater breeze. Last up is to talk about the Zamp Solar and Battleborn batteries. Essential? Oh my goodness. Depends on how you camp. Now we're yes. in a dry camping site right there with the ocean view, so I'd say that it was pretty, how was the hair dryer this morning? <laughs> it was fantastic. Yes, and how was the coffee? Fantastic. That's pretty good too. So <laughs> as you know, if you saw our uh, solar panel upgrade video, we have four lithium batteries, a 3000 watt Victron inverter, and three ZAMP solar panels up here. And I'd say the only deficiency that we're having is that my truck is not charging the rig, the batteries, through the alternator. And it's something I just have to hook up with Ford. I've looked at the fuses, I've checked everything, I've been on the forums, I even checked to see if the power's coming through, I can't figure it out. So I gotta go to the dealership. That's the missing link for us because when we drive, we're not getting any power. We're not getting we have 100%. no regen. You know when your little hearts go away in the video game? <laughs> 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 so the thing about Alaska is that the sun, even when it's up, is a really steep angle, so we're not getting the full power. And it rains so much, and we only get one or two hours of sun per day. Alaska is not ideal conditions. I think we can provide a better evaluation of the entire system when we're back down in the lower 48. Yes. Back in our regular weather. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But we are maintaining and thankfully we have the system that we have. Otherwise, we would not be able to be in the spot we're in right now. It, well, and all the other dry camping we've done on the way and just like charging laptops and batteries and editing videos and like even dry camping overnight. It's been, it's been nice. It's, it's the next level of freedom. Yes. All right, that is it for this video. We hope you found it helpful and we have more videos just like this to help you plan and prepare for your trip to Alaska. It's just, it's bound to happen. You're, you're eventually gonna come to Alaska, <laughs> right? It's a blast. Yeah. And then uh, what's next Sunday, Trish? Next Sunday is Anchorage and I go to Chicago to pick up our boy. Carson gets done with camp. Yep. I'm super excited to pick him up and bring him back home. All right, that's it for this weekend. We'll catch you next Sunday. Bye.